I'm born and raised in West Philly, so I grew up at 54th and Master. Uh, Carla Cool, um, I am 40 years old, and I'm happy to say. Okay. You're running for city council because you're tired of the machine. Yes. Could you tell us about that and what really motivated you? To do this. The most important thing to me about running is I don't have all the answers. The community knows what their problems are, and a lot of the solutions are in the community. We just need to listen and we need to come together. And people have to stop being us versus them. But like, we can be a better nation together. We can be a city together. But we have to sit down, we have to talk, and we have to figure it out together. And not just these people having all of the power. I don't care if you're not educated. I don't care if you don't have three degrees like me. There are things that you know better than I will ever know, and I, I want to listen to that. And I feel like we need to start listening. And will you have business sessions? Oh, yeah. I, I'm actually, I, the more I can have listening sessions, the more I want. So we're trying to plan some of that now. But I'm talking about if elected, I want to transform. When elected, there you go. When elected, I want to transform how we listen to the community. That should be the priority. I, I shouldn't be going to an agency first to ask them what they think so that they can go and ask the people. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So I'm an attorney. I used to work for TURN, uh, but I also have my own law practice. I've had it since 2015 called Legal Empowerment Group. It's a um, general practitioner. Low bono. So what I do is I um, create an opportunity for people who don't, who normally can't afford attorneys, to have legal access. So I work on a sliding scale, um, and I do things that relate to people's livelihood, family law, contracts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's really just to give an open door to people who would normally not have it. multiple reasons. Uh, while I was in law school, one of the things I realized is that the, the legal system is based on this idea of de democracy and people being involved in the process. Um, and while I was sitting in law school, I realized very quickly that one of the reasons that the laws look the way they do now, right, not years ago, but the way now, is because people like me, people from my community, don't know how the system actually works. So nearly 80 to 90% of people who go to family court are unrepresented. So they don't have attorneys, right? But they don't know what the basis of things are. They don't know what the rules. So they go in and they're functioning from what seems practical to them. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to reach the people who there's a reason why they're not getting attorneys. They can't afford it. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to bridge the gap and educate people on what they needed to know so they can get outcomes. So they still can go to court. They don't need a lawyer to be their hero, but they need more information. So it was, I wanted to educate people for the purpose of getting better outcomes. I wanted to create more, get us closer and closer to democracy by helping the people to have a better understanding of how the system works. And I wanted to give access to people who normally don't have access. So I really, I'm always thinking about where I came from and who, who has, like I, now I'm in a position sort of a power because I'm a lawyer, but I realize that so much of what I grew up in, um, people just don't have access to stuff. So I wanted to bring access. What I started to realize is that a lot of decisions were being made for the people, but not by the people, right? So they weren't getting a voice. That decisions were made and then it went back to them. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to create transparency, right? I wanted to tell people the truth, open it up. I wanted to get us to democracy. Right now, we're generally in an aristocracy, not in a democracy. Um, thank you. So we... Um, to me what I saw over I've, I've thought it before but then I had an opportunity to see it at work was people who are in position of power connected with other people who are in position of power and they interact with each other and they make these decisions and then they fake bring it to the people ask the people's opinion and then they still do what they were going to do anyway despite that um, and that just doesn't work for me right that's just not democracy and additionally, this is important, uh, my background is 
When I was 25, I quit my job and I moved to Japan. I was unhappy with the world, so I was like, I want a, a better life. So I moved to Japan. I lived there for four and a half years. Wonderful, great experience. Transformative to me. Um, one of the happiest times in my life. But then I started to feel this guilt um, about the community I came from. I was living this sort of cushy experience and I wanted to come back. But what was clear in Japan was I'm living in a capitalist society where there's health care for everyone, where poverty is not the norm, where there's access to things. And so I started to see that it was possible for things to be better. Come here, become a lawyer, and I started finding out why it's bad, right? It's not that it can't be better. It's because there are people who want to insulate themselves and maintain the power that they have so they keep the people ignorant so they stay in positions of power. So I want to give the information to the people lift up the power of the people so the people begin to make the decisions collectively and collaboratively. I could go into them piece by piece, but really what I want to do is address poverty, right? Because I think by addressing poverty, you deal with criminal justice, you deal with schools, you deal with housing, you deal with um, just quality of life, right? You're going to hit on all of those things. You also actually hit on environmental issues because um, the poor are going to be the first to feel the effects of climate change and all of that. Uh, food deserts, all of that. So if you begin to address the issues of poverty, you begin to transform all of these things and the, vice versa. If I work on a bill that is related to criminal justice reform, I start to affect poverty. When I work on housings and schools, I start to attract. So all of them are related to each other. So poverty is a um, number one. Um, in addressing poverty, I really want to increase the quality of um, businesses, small businesses growing and incubating businesses that come from out of the community, right? So there are so many people in the community who have great ideas, but they can't get from idea to implementation. And there are programs out there, but they don't have access to it. So I want to create an opportunity for that. I want a commercial corridor on Lancaster Avenue where people can live in their neighborhood and walk to stuff that benefits them. Cafes inherently are not bad. We associate them with gentrification. What's bad is when people from the outside come in and bring it in and then they take away from other people they don't even have a chance for power. So, so definitely with economics, moving us with, with the entrepreneurship and creating more jobs, moving us closer and closer to a livable wage, not just increasing the minimum wage, but too many people are just struggling every day, which again takes us back to poverty, right? So those are those are the big issues for me in taking that. Now that goes further to the other one. Transparency in government. I love technology. I do not understand why in 2019 the people cannot have a technological interaction with city council at city council meetings. It doesn't make sense. Unless you are intentionally trying to make sure that the people don't have access. I understand when we had horses and buggies, you couldn't do it, but now we don't. So, um, so creating transparency and efficiency. Are you in a position to advocate for like healthcare for all? Is that something that can be done? On the city council level, is not really right. That's really a federal thing. It really needs it. There are things that we could do um, on the city council level. Uh, especially in allocating money and uh, since we create the budget, well city council creates the budget, we can think through that but if you really want to address health care, it has to be addressed on a federal level and deal with a lot of the, um, the issues around pharmaceutical companies and the, the cost of all of these things, you have to deal with it all together as a, a bundle package. So anything, realistically, anything done on a city council level would be a band-aid, it won't be a solution, right? right? But it could be a push to like... Push towards. Government. We could start trying to do things that will model ideas and create ideas or even um, create uh, particular proposals to the federal government for funding and start trying to model things on a local level. Yeah, that's possible. Okay, this is, that's a crisis in Philadelphia. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. My mother, my mother's on disability. She's really sick. One of the things that 
ticks me off. She's been having trouble. She's on oxygen, right? So this is just absolutely ridiculous. So they told her that they wouldn't deliver her oxygen to her because she didn't pay her bill. But it was the bill for the same month because she had paid last month's bill and she hadn't received it yet. And it's $22. So you're telling me you can't give someone something that they need to sustain their life for $22, greed, this, this, it, sorry, it just makes me angry. It's ridiculous. You, there should never be a question, right? I just talked to a friend, just found out a, a friend of mine has cancer, and part of it was she wouldn't go to the doctors because it was going to cost too much to go get a lump checked out, right? So the cancer progressed. Uh, the fact that we make a cost-benefit analysis of whether I'm going to go get help right because I can't afford it it's ridiculous and it doesn't have to happen so many countries have national health care why does not why doesn't the US greed <laughs>housing right or I have many thoughts but one I think one of the issues we have is that we make it too difficult for people to keep their homes right um, so dealing with like tax abatement I know that this is something they're trying to address now especially because we're in the election cycle so everyone wants to deal with it tax abatements have to go they just from a logical standpoint they don't make sense right you take the people who actually have all the money and tell them that they don't have to pay <laughs> and then the people who have no money you tell them they do it just doesn't make sense so that putting that aside one this goes back to the business's idea I was talking about incubating from the inside out right so one of the things that we really need to do is make it so the neighborhood is not desirable for developers to come in and destroy, right? And so that's being able to build it from the inside, too. Um, a lot of generational wealth comes through passing your property down from generation to generation, right? So um, because, back to poverty, right? So many people are dealing with poverty, a developer comes in and gives them this number to buy their house. We need to make it so people don't sell their houses, right? And if you want to move on and go somewhere else, rent it out, right? Because, because you have so many people who need housing, rent it, keep it, rent it, pass it to your children. Have your children pass it on to your children and make it easier for them so they're not building from scratch, right? They, they're starting off with something. So that's another way of dealing with housing. Another, there's also this internal smaller way of dealing with housing. I have a friend that's from Syria and he was telling me uh, that it, with all of the, the civil war and everything that goes on in Soviet, Syria, he said, I thought it was so strange when I came to America, because everyone talks about how great it is, that most people don't own, the, they don't own their own homes. I don't, I'm a renter, right? I, I rent for, I have my reasons for renting, but um, I could own, right? So I'm making that choice. Most people don't have a choice, right? So when he, he said, it's just weird to me, why is it so expensive or so hard for people to be able to have property in the United States? One of the things I, I constantly think about with this is, um, we have so many abandoned properties in Philadelphia. You have so many homeless, and you have so many people who are in the in-between who are trying to move from being a renter to being a homeowner. Why aren't there more programs to help them take and gut these abandoned properties as individuals? You know who gets to do that? People with money. Developers, right? So that, there, I think that there are more very practical ways of dealing with it. From the city government level, um, we have to stop letting the people who most benefit from the, the decisions they're making be the only ones in the room, right? Um, so, and that wraps around to the property at 46 and Market. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if it was on your page or somebody else's page. I was looking. Um, they're trying to rehab that property at 46 and Market, and they wanted to make it an incubator, where it would have housing and food and 
things to help the community and the city is writing them on those properties. Do you know anything about I don't, and I, I can look that up, but that, that that is definitely, those are the things I think about. So I was just talking to someone yesterday. What I, I would love to see, especially in West Philly, because the West Philly I grew up in, I'm not saying it was the best area of the city, but it has going down so tremendously that people you can't walk to the movie theater you you there's no place to go sit in, in a cafe and get on the internet you uh, we black people love going shopping right why do we have to drive a car to go shopping if we go shop anyway why isn't there places in our community that we can walk that's owned by people in the community but anyway so sorry that those things just really irritate me over and over again um, but I, I keep thinking, how do we figure out amongst ourselves, right? Oh, I was talking about the gentleman from Syria. He talked about how when he moved, like he's uh, asyl he came here to get asylum and stuff. When he first came, a bunch of him and his friends who were Syrian, who had to come, they put their money together to try to get on their feet, right? In the community, I know that our city government is doing a lot of things that hurt us, but inside of the community, we need to come together and start supporting each other and doing like micro lending within the community, right? And the, the government, the city government has programs for this, but they don't tell anybody about it, right? And so that's where, the more I'm learning, the more I'm like, oh, we have that in the city, oh, we have that in the city, but only the same people who have the same relationships with city people know about it and get all of the money. That needs to be expanded, right? These opportunities should be for all. Liberty and justice for all, not some. <laughs> and that's where the um, feet. Close the creek tank yes. Yes. Right there on the nose on that. Yes, I loved close the creek. Um, I, one of the things that really stood out that day for me, and I am not being a hater when I say this, it was a distinction between the community leaders when they talked about issues in the community and the elected official. There was a real connect with the community and an understanding of what was going on, and a real disconnect on the other side with it. They were saying good things that things that made sense but it was like are you listening you're missing the point and so I love the ideas especially when they talked about but I forget who the gentleman was and he said why is it that we have programs that are working in our community and that are helping and that people love and they go to but they're not getting the funding but then other people are getting the funding and there was no answer I was like come on guys like but there, that the close the creek opened my eyes so much to um, the, the fact that they were on two different sides, right? It tells so much about what's wrong, right? They should have been, it, it, known each other. Some of them didn't even know these people's names, but everybody in the community knew their names. Just crazy. How do you feel about legalizing marijuana? Oh, I'm for it. Yeah, one hundred percent for it. And here's why. I have a number of reasons. And I'm going to say, not a marijuana smoker, not interested in it. Even if it was legal, I probably would never do it, right? That's not why. Number one, it would be a totally new taxable source, right? We need new taxable source. It is ridiculous that in 2019, we are still using real estate taxes to fund public schools. Makes no sense, right? Um, and economists have been saying for years how much money legalization of marijuana would bring to the economy. Two, it deals with criminal records, right? If we could legalize it and then retroactively remove the criminal records of all those who went to jail purely related to marijuana, then you also open the opportunity for jobs and this removing stigma away from people. And there, I, yeah, I don't even get that. So then further, the other benefit to legalization of marijuana is that marijuana does have medicinal value, right? And there are ways to do it so it's not just, you gotta go, and it's not just about getting high. There are a lot of good properties. I had to look it up because I have issues with my joints and I was reading all of the things that are out there and it has the 
least effects. Most of the medicine that you get from the doctors for your joints, you know, side effect could go cause blindness, could deteriorate your liver, could deteriorate your kidneys. And I'm like, but we take this thing that is very healthy and has so many good properties and we're throwing people in jail for it. But then we make pills like oxycodone, right? and say that it's legal but if you use it too much now it's, it's just it doesn't it doesn't make sense you can go to carla l cruel.org or carla cruel.com either one is the same you i'm on facebook at carla cruel um, I'm on Twitter at Carla underscore cool. I'm on Instagram at Carla underscore cool. And here's the great thing. What I'm doing is I'm teaching people through the process. I'm going to talk about the law. I'm going to talk about the government. So if you follow me on all of those, every Thursday at 7 p.m. I'm doing Facebook Live. It's conversations with Carla. We're going to talk about issues. We're going to talk about life. We're going to just talk about what is so people can get. I'm finding so, find many, so many different, many different mentality. mentality. It, it, seems it, seems hard. Hard. it seems hard. It seems challenging. I don't say it's hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything, everything else, else is a else challenge. Is a challenge. Um, so, 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 I'm ready for, I'm this, ready challenge. for this challenge. And I was